Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a big thank you to today's sponsor, which is Surfshark. Surfshark VPN is an app and browser extension that basically lets you place your laptop or your phone anywhere in the world. Using Surfshark, you can access websites in any country as if you were in that country. So basically, this means that you can have access to and unlock a bunch of different websites and content that you normally would not be able to see. All you have to do is change your location and you can have access to a bunch of different streaming services that are not available in your country including 15 different Netflix libraries. A VPN it can also be an extra layer of security when you're online to keep all of your passwords, your photos, your videos, and all of your other information safe. With a Surfshark VPN, you can protect yourself from data theft, tracking, surveillance, and commercial targeting. You can block ads and malware from your computer, and you can keep your information safe when you're on public Wi-Fi, which is a huge reason why I use a VPN, because let me tell Tell you public Wi-Fi is anything but safe. It's very easy for a hacker to access your banking information, your shopping information, or access your private social media accounts when you are using public Wi-Fi. So having a VPN is a great way to keep yourself safe from the potential of having your information stolen from you. I have personally experienced someone being able to access my banking information and trying to use that to buy things with my money all because I accessed public Wi-Fi from an airport. Thankfully, I was able to recover everything, but overall, it was such a scary experience, and I'm so happy that I've decided to take the extra measures to prevent that from happening again. It's also really nice as a true crime YouTuber who is always doing research and trying to access the best information possible. I can use the VPN to access articles from anywhere in the world and bring you guys the best possible information that I can. Surfshark is super user friendly, which is something that I need because I am such a grandma when it comes to technology so I need something that is easy as possible to use and let me tell you Surfshark has been an absolute breeze. The good news is that my subscribers can get an amazing discount for a service that is already so very affordable. Just go ahead and click the link down below and use code Rachel to get 85% off plus three extra months free. Surfshark also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is absolutely zero risk to just go ahead and give it a try. So again, just make sure to go ahead and check the description box down below, click the link, and use code Rachel to get 85% off plus three extra months free. It has never been so easy and affordable to keep your information safe and browse the internet with ease. Thank you again to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get right into today's case. So the case that I have for you guys today is a very wild one. I do want to give you a little bit of a warning, which I know is something that I've been doing in a lot of my most recent videos. But again, because of the information in today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and tell you that if you are very sensitive to acts against children, then you might not want to watch this video. This is a very disturbing case and there's a lot of information about things that you truly just don't think happen, but they do. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to cover the case today is because it sheds a light on things that happen that you never would have ever thought could happen in the world, but it does and it's really disturbing. And I'm really glad that with the way a lot of the things in this case went, this was able to come to light, but at the same time, a girl is missing probably because of what was going on, which we will get into in just a minute. I know I'm being very vague, but again, this is a warning that there's a lot of very disturbing information in this case. But with that being said, let's just get right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Brittany Wood. Brittany Wood was born on September 25th, 1992, and she was only 19 years old when she went missing on May 30th, 2012, from where she lived in Mobile, Indiana. Now, from the very beginning, Brittany had it very rough and grew up in very difficult circumstances. I will tell you a lot more about her family members and her family life a little bit later because that's a huge part in this case. But when Brittany was only nine years old, Old, she was actually sexually abused by her step-grandfather. She was obviously very 
traumatized by this, so she didn't tell anyone about it until she was actually 12 years old. Her attacker was a man named Ronald Robertson, and he was taken to court and she did testify, and she actually sent her attacker to a prison sentence of 25 years to life. Brittany dropped out of high school when she was 14, and by the age of 17, Brittany gave birth to her first daughter, who she named Peyton. Around the time that she went missing, Brittany was using various drugs and didn't really have a solid place to go home. She she and Peyton just sort of bounced around different family members' homes who, of course, helped her take care of little Peyton. She also had a firearm for personal protection that she carried with her as well. But other than that, we don't really know much more about Brittany, which is just so frustrating. There isn't a lot of information about who Brittany was or what she liked to do or about her disappearance in general. Now, on May 30th, 2012, according to family members, Brittany told them that she was going to be going to visit her uncle, Donald Holland, in the Styx River area. He had come and picked her up from her home and family members saw her getting into his car at around 7.30 p.m. that night. After that, as abruptly as this is, we have no idea what happened and Brittany Wood was never seen or heard from ever again. Now, at first, no one really noticed that she was missing. She didn't come home that night, but it seemed like the way that her family was, she could be out for a while, not come home for a bit, and not contact anyone, and that seemed to be the norm. Again, she did seem to kind of bounce around from house to house, so it didn't really seem like anyone knew where Brittany was all the time. No one really batted an eye at first when she didn't come back home. It wasn't until the next day on June 1st, 2012, that people started to raise an eyebrow and wondered where Brittany was. The suspicions grew even further when the family made a very disturbing discovery. Donald Holland had been found by his wife in his truck in Baldwin County, unconscious in the front seat of his car after suffering a gunshot wound to his head. He had apparently been shot in the back of his head behind the ear in what looked like a suicide. Apparently, his wife went out looking for him and found him in his car because he had left the home after threatening to take his own life. But we will talk a little bit more about this in just a little bit. So, in the car, they found Brittany's cell phone battery as well as her gun, but Brittany was nowhere to be found. They rushed Donald to the hospital because at this point, he was still alive. However, he never regained consciousness and he did die a few days later in the hospital. But at this point, police were really starting to wonder about Brittany. And this is really what started the catalyst into figuring out that Brittany's family had been involved in some very, very disturbing things. And it might be the very reason why Brittany was missing and why Donald was dead. So, a few days before Brittany's disappearance, a teenage relative of Brittany's had reached out to her on Facebook and claimed that she had been raped by a family member. Like I said in the beginning of the video, Brittany was also the survivor of her own sexual abuse and did not just want to sit idly by as she watched another family member meet the same fate as her. So according to interviews with her mother, Brittany was actually intending on bringing up the rape to her uncle, Donald Holland, the day that she was supposed to meet up with him. It's speculated at this point that she did confront him and threatened to go to police. Now, Donald Holland was already in investigation because at the time, he was already facing numerous sexual abuse allegations from members of the family. So, he was scheduled to testify in court about these allegations just a few days after he was found dead. Because of this, and the fact that police had apparently already been tipped off before Brittany went missing, investigators started to look more into Donald Holland, and this is when they discovered a much larger operation of sexual abuse against children in the family. Detectives realized that Donald Holland, his wife Wendy, and numerous other relative and family friends had all been taking part in these group sex parties that involved having sexual encounters with children in the family. As many as 16 children were groomed from a very young age to eventually end up being sexually abused by one or more of the adults. The older children were apparently the ones that were being abused while the younger children were made to watch until they were 
old enough to be abused themselves. Over the years, several complaints and allegations were made against the family, but it seems that none of them were ever actually pursued. After the disappearance and apparent suicide, however, two victims came forward with detailed accounts of what had been happening within the family for generations. Police started rounding up family members one by one to bring them in and question them all. And by all accounts, Donald Holland was the ringleader of it all. So now let's get into each individual named in this entire sex ring. This is going to get very confusing because there are so many people involved and we know more about some family members than others and some have been to court for their charges while others had not. Some have been convicted while others have not. So I'm going to be going kind of back and forth with a timeline just so I can explain each person's individual involvement without it getting too confusing and jumping back and forth between people. So again, I'm going to try my best to go ahead and explain everything in this huge tangled web of abuse. So first we have Derek Wood, Brittany's brother. He was one of the many arrested with charges of sexual abuse, but is not necessarily someone who was at the forefront of all of this. In an interview, he said that the abuse began when he was seven years old. And then as he grew older, he named Donald Holland as the one who manipulated him into becoming an abuser himself. Several other family members pinned the orchestration on Donald Holland. A few months after the death and disappearance appearance, police were able to obtain a search warrant for Donald's home. And they found that there were videos on Donald's computer showing Brittany Wood and another minor, both of which were under 13 at the time of the video, being sexually abused by adults. So besides Donald Holland, the main player here is Donald's wife, Wendy Holland. Wendy seemed to be just as bad as Donald in this entire thing. When she wasn't sexually abusing children, Wendy worked as a certified nursing assistant at a local veterans clinic taking care of sick and injured vets. So Wendy was charged and taken to trial for sodomy, sexual torture, and sexual abuse of a child. At the trial, a 16-year-old took the stand to talk about what Wendy did to her. She said that she was being sexually abused from the time that she was in diapers as far as she can remember. She said that her earliest memories are that of her having sex with several adult relatives, one of which was Wendy. She said that her, along with several other adults and children in the family, would be in this circle doing sexual things and then they would just switch. She said this happened all the time and there would be as many as six people involved at one time. Other witnesses at the trial confirmed pretty much the same thing. We don't exactly know the identity of this witness because she is a minor, but we do know that she is either a family member or a family friend. Then another witness came forward named Dustin Kent, the husband of Wendy's twin sister, both of whom I will talk more about in just a minute. So he admitted that he was an active participant in this entire thing. He spoke about the 16 year old victim who I just mentioned saying that she had been abused for so long that engaging in these sexual acts, especially with Wendy was basically like second nature to her. It's all that this girl knew. And I will also mention that this 16 year old victim stated that she loved Wendy. And at first she didn't want Wendy to get in trouble, which just shows how manipulated she was by all of these adults who were doing these disgusting things to her. Dustin Kent admitted that he would watch these sexual acts between this minor and Wendy and that he would then participate in them. The next person to testify against Wendy was Derek Wood, who I just mentioned. He said the first time that he was involved with Wendy was when he was 14 years old. Several other family members came forward admitting their involvement with children and other adults within the family. Everyone told the same story of Wendy being involved with this abuse for decades. At the end of her trial, the jury deliberated for only two hours before sentencing her to life in prison on the charges that I mentioned before. I also do want to mention that Wendy still maintains her innocence and believes that she has done absolutely nothing wrong. The next person we have is Mendy Kent, who is Wendy's twin sister. She is also accused of sodomy and sexual abuse of a child under 12. At the end of her trial, she was sentenced to 40 years. She got 20 years for sodomy and 20 years for sexual abuse of a child, which was the max sentence that they could serve. Then her husband, Dustin Kent, is accused of 
being a 13 year old girl after luring her with a pet hamster while her own father watched. He is being charged with first degree sodomy, second degree rape, second degree incest and production of obscene matter of a person under 17. Now, as we saw before, he testified in court against Wendy, hoping that he would face lesser charges. And in the end, he actually did. He took a plea deal that dropped his incest charge and pled guilty to a second degree rape and second degree sodomy. And he was sentenced to 17 years in prison. Next is Randall Wood, who is also Wendy's brother. Now, apparently he too felt that there was no use in hiding the family's secret anymore. While his sibling is denying all accusations, apparently Randall is the one that actually wanted to not only speak out against the family's abuse, but his own abuse. He began talking to law enforcement about what was going on within the family. He was also the one who made the initial report to police for them to actually start digging into the family and uncovering all of these different layers. But either way, he was charged with a second degree sexual abuse, sodomy, incest, and enticing a child into a building or a dwelling. I don't know a ton about his sentencing, but he did receive a split sentence where he is serving three years on a 15 year term and then will be on probation for five years. I assume that the judge went easy on him because of his willingness to speak about all of this, but I don't know for sure. That's just what I speculate. Next is Brittany's mother, Chessie Wood. Now, she has come out to talk about how awful the things her sister Wendy has done, but she is not so innocent herself. Now, she denies all allegations against her and said that she had no idea about what was going on in the family until her daughter's disappearance. However, she's being accused of having sex with a young female relative, and she too was being charged with sodomy and abuse of a minor. But in the end, she pled guilty to just a charge of reckless endangerment, which is a misdemeanor. I don't know too much else about these other charges that she's being accused with, but I'm not sure if she's going to trial for these other charges or if she is just being stuck with reckless endangerment and that's it. Now, Chessie's son, Derek, or Brittany's brother, as well as Donnie and Wendy's son, Donnie Jr., have youthful offender status, so their charges are not being made public. But as we learned earlier, Derek did admit to becoming an abuser after years of being a victim himself. So then in addition to the eight family members being charged, there are three family friends involved as well. William Brownlee was being charged with second degree sodomy and sexual abuse, as well as second degree sexual abuse against a child. In trial, a witness explained that she was forced to have sex with him several times. This witness was a relative of Brittany Wood, and she said that for so long, she thought that having sex with this adult man was just normal. Another witness who was the sister of the first witness testified that he had sex with her when she was in eighth grade. Then yet another witness testified that he attempted to have sex with her when she was 12, but she was able to get him to stop touching her after she said no. Now he was originally supposed to take a plea deal, but he actually ended up backing out of it. He claimed that he himself was being sexually abused for for years and years and years by members of the family. He also did admit that he had sex with one of the witnesses, but he said that he thought she was 21 years old at the time. In the end, he was charged and convicted of having sex with a young girl when she was 12 or 13 years old, but unfortunately, I was not able to find anywhere exactly how long his sentence was. Nelson Morgan is being charged with first degree rape and sex abuse of a child younger than 12. However, at his trial, he took a plea deal and pled guilty to attempting to have sex with a child under the age of 12. He was also given a split sentence of time served, which was two years, and then he will be on probation for five years. Lastly, we have Jennifer Moore. She is being charged with second degree sexual abuse and production of child pornography but I could not find much more about if she went to trial or if she was sentenced or if she's in jail or anything like that. At the end of it all, 11 people were charged in relation to this entire sex ring. Eight of them were family members related to Brittany, while three others were family friends. To this day, we still have no idea where Brittany Wood is 
or what happened to her. From what I have seen, it seems like Britney's stepmom, Stephanie Hank, was not involved in any of this, and she's actually been an advocate for finding Britney the entire time. She runs a Facebook page for Britney and is always posting updates about her. And to this day, investigators are still searching for Britney. As recently as July of this year, police received a tip based on an age progression photo that was released of Britney. They searched an area in Grand Bay behind a trailer and an area that extends far beyond the trailer into the woods. Family members helped with the search and they used a drone to fly overhead and they brought in machinery to help as well. As far as I have seen so far, they haven't found anything in this area, but investigators had said that they will continue searching until there is nowhere left to search in this area. So to me, because of how hard they are trying to search this area and how much effort they're putting in, it seems like this could be a pretty credible lead and we might be finding out some answers in the near future. As of right now, investigators have said that they are doing everything that they can to protect Brittany's daughter from all of this, that she doesn't really need to be exposed to everything that's going on, and hopes that they can come to her with answers when she's old enough to understand. So now I want to talk a little bit about the main theories in this case. There is really just one main theory when it comes to what happened to Brittany, and then there are other little ideas within that theory. The main theory as you probably have guessed by now, is that Donald Holland had something to do with Britney's disappearance. Like I had mentioned earlier, it was thought that Britney had been planning to confront Donald about the allegations against him. We also know that we found her gun in his car as well as her cell phone battery. It's possible that she did confront him that day and then threatened to out this entire operation. So he decided to kill her and get rid of her to prevent his secret from coming out. I do think that this seems to be the most obvious answer and the answer that most information points to. One of the biggest questions though is who all knows about this? Was killing Brittany like a planned thing that other family members, maybe Wendy, already knew about? Or was Donald just planning on this being a normal day with his niece and then she confronted him unexpectedly and then he killed her in the moment and then decided to take his own life before anyone found out? I do feel like Wendy might know something. She might know exactly what happened, but at the same time, I feel like it's possible that this was something that was in the moment and he just did this without telling anybody. The other factor in this case that poses some questions is, did Donald really take his own life? So, like I said earlier, the gunshot was found in the back of his head behind his ear. According to experts, this is a very difficult place for someone to shoot themselves, and it is much more likely for someone to shoot themselves in the temple, I also want to say that I couldn't find anywhere if it was Brittany's gun that was used or if maybe she had just been carrying it at the time and, you know, it was left in his car. Not 100% sure. Don't know if they found another gun. I don't know if they ran tests for gunshot residue or, you know, the position of whatever gun was used in the car. Was it, you know, in his hand still? Was it on the floor? I'm not sure, I didn't see that anywhere. I don't really know any of those details whatsoever, but I do think that those details could definitely give us answers on if he truly took his own life. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a good bit of information that could point towards Donald wanting to take his own life since, again, he could have just been possibly confronted by Brittany. Plus, we know that he had a court appearance coming up in just a few days that could send him to jail and expose the entire family for what had been going on for decades. If someone did take his life, I don't know who I think it would have been. The only other theory that I can think of if Donald did not take his own life was that maybe when Donald picked Brittany up, Wendy was already with him, so maybe she sat in the backseat of his car when she confronted him and it caused a heated argument and maybe she shot him from the back seat. but then obviously Wendy isn't gonna take that, so she turned around and shot Brittany. So as I'm editing, I realized I did not explain my thoughts as well as I wanted to, so what I was trying to say was that when Brittany got in the car and Wendy was already with him that Wendy was already in the front passenger seat and then Brittany 
was the one who sat in the back seat and possibly could have shot Donald in the back of the head while sitting in the back seat. Maybe she then hid her body and then that's just how Wendy happened to find Donald's body after he shot himself because she already knew where he was and she already knew what happened. Obviously, this is all just pure speculation. There's absolutely nothing pointing towards any of this. I literally just thought of it in my head as a possibility just using the information that we have. But like I said, we don't have a lot of information. There could be a ton of information that points directly against this or towards it that we just don't know because it has not been made available to the public. But at the end of the day, a little girl lost her mother and they are still looking for her. I am at least thankful that Brittany's disappearance brought out this huge family secret that's been going on for decades and finally brought it to a stop and brought charges against those involved. Again, this is something that had been happening unchecked for generations within the family and it's finally come to an end. 11 people have been charged with disgusting crimes against children and many of them are sitting in jail because of it. So now we just need to focus on finding Brittany and getting justice for her and her daughter. But that is all I have for today's video. I know it was a difficult one to listen to. It is absolutely disgusting what these people got away with for so, so long. But at the end of the day, at least they're sitting in jail. So now I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments. Do you think that Donald Holland took his own life? Do you think that Brittany took his life and she paid for that? Do you think that she was gonna confront him and that is why he decided to kill her and hide her? please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to check out my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to go ahead and check out Surfshark, which will also be linked down in the description box below. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.